watches a scary movie. My name is T, and of course, we are talking scary movies. I appreciate you tuning in. Remember, new episodes go up at 8.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time every Wednesday night. You can find both the video versions and the audio versions by going through my link tree, which is linktr.com dot ee slash t scary movie if you get subscribed that'll give you the links to the video versions on youtube the audio only versions on your favorite podcasting platforms my letterbox for written reviews and then my tiktok for all the fun videos i'm making in the world of horror hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date with everything that's going on or if you're just on one of those other platforms hit subscribe as well too because that helps me out as well so folks tonight I am going to be talking season five of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. I mentioned that a number of folks have been talking about this a lot on social media in the last couple of weeks. Give me a bit of a hankering to go back and catch it because season five is arguably considered to be the best season of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer TV show. So I thought, what better time than now? So that is what I'm going to be talking about tonight. But don't forget... In addition to my Wednesday night episodes, I do multiple reviews throughout the week, so it's just another reason to hit that subscribe button. But before we jump into Buffy, folks, I told you I was giving away a free copy of Thanksgiving, the digital version, at the end of this month. And on the Wednesday night shows, I give you two questions apiece, chance to earn a point by giving me the answer in the comment section on the video. Then I'll put everybody who answered and got them right into a raffle, and you're going to get a free digital copy of Thanksgiving. So question number one for tonight, question number one here for tonight, folks. In The Exorcist, we're talking the original film, the demon Pazuzu does not possess which character? Is it Chris McNeil? Is it Reagan McNeil? Or is it Father Damien Karras? Again, which of these three characters does Pazuzu not possess In the original Exorcist film, is it Chris McNeil, Reagan McNeil, or Father Damien Karras? Tell me in the comment section if you get it right. That's another point you have towards winning a free copy of Eli Roth's Thanksgiving. I'll be back with question number two at the end of the show, folks, so don't go anywhere. Now, let's jump into Buffy. We're going to try to get this as quickly as possible. Now, here's the thing, folks. I'm trying to keep this habit of getting everything to you in 10 minutes or less, but I want a little bit more time to talk about Buffy. So, tonight, I'm going to be doing this in 15 minutes or less, and I will have a second episode that's going to premiere right after this one to talk a little more for anybody who wants a little Buffy overtime, all right? So, let's jump right into it here, and I'm going to split things up up into three different sections folks we're gonna talk Buffy we're gonna talk the Scoobies and we're gonna talk the villain so we might as well get started by jumping right into discussing Buffy herself now when we left off at the end of season four Buffy is in a relationship with Riley Finn her and the Scoobies have just done defeating the cyborg Adam, which was being designed by the government organization that Riley worked for, The Initiative, and who decided that he had his own plans for what he was going to do with the entire world. And Buffy and the Scoobies managed to defeat them by all uh, giving Buffy their essence. And that's how Buffy ripped his heart out. And we left the season off with Buffy having an encounter with the first Slayer hopefully giving her some insight on what it truly means to be a vampire slayer in the first place. So we start off season four with Buffy having an encounter with Dracula of all vampires. And this was big. I remember this was huge for me because, you know, it's Dracula, but you don't really expect to see Buffy going against like these like very famous vampires. Like, even though she makes a joke about it, we're not expecting Lestat to show up and for Buffy to face off against her Count Orlock or anything like that. So it's really cool to have seen Dracula appear in Buffy. But this also sets up Buffy for a lot of the character arcs that she's going to deal with over the course of the season because Dracula makes it very clear to Buffy that she's a killer, she's a hunter, and that she doesn't really understand herself. And that was a lot of what season four talked about because Buffy and her friends are entering college. And as a young woman, she's learning so much more about herself and the way that the world works. And that kind of translates to this season as well, too, that Buffy's really starting to get an idea of what the real world is like. And that's kind of being told through the struggles that she's having as a slayer. And it's interesting because 
this also is where the seeds of distrust and the issues between her and Riley really start to begin because it's not that Buffy's in love with Dracula, but when she finds herself seduced, that's where you can start seeing Riley with his cracks as well, that what he has to offer Buffy may not be enough for her and he feels like he just doesn't have as much to offer her as a lot of other guys she's dated in the past. Even all these new guys that are showing up. It seems to be a lot of vampires. And Riley's feeling pretty insecure about that. And it, 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 the fact that she's distracted with not only her struggles as the Slayer, but also the fact that she's struggling with her mom's health. She's struggling with the emergence of her little sister Dawn. And the fact that she's feeling a little isolated from the Scoobies because her college life isn't working out the way that we got to see in the previous season, her relationship's down in the dumps, nothing's really working out here for Buffy. And so the season as a whole gives her this journey to where she's struggling to find out, is death the only thing I have to offer? Is killing vampires and demons? And it's honestly the best journey that Buffy has had ever since season two. So getting to see this growth from her fantastic for the character sarah michelle geller gets so many great acting opportunities with buffy uh whether it's you know when riley's leaving her interactions with spike or the body which is the quite possibly the best episode uh that buffy the vampire slayer has produced it's just a wonderful wonderful job and sarah michelle geller kills it it's almost interesting to think that you know they knew they were going to another network like that buffy was leaving wb at this point and it almost feels like they should have just let the show go. And I know folks love se uh, season six and seven, and I get that completely, but such a fitting end for her showing she's finally learned and she's finally evolved and just a really great ending it would have been with the show. Now, over to talk about the Scoobies, everybody's in a bit of a different place here. Uh, Xander gets to continue the trend of getting an episode dedicated to him, which I always thought was so interesting that they take the time to really give Xander character progression in just these like sing one or two episodes per season. Because a lot of the other Scoobies, I feel, get the progression over the season as a whole, but Xander really is the one who gets like an episode or two dedicated to him. Like whether it was like the Zeppo back in season three or Bewitched, Bewildered and Bothered back in season two. Uh, you know, he gets these episodes to really build for himself. And this one is no different here to where this season, uh, you know, he gets to be Dracula's Renfield, his lackey in the first episode of the season, which really plays up a lot of the inadequacies uh, uh, that he has with himself. And then later on, an episode to where him and Anya are looking into a new place that they want to buy and a demon that's hunting Buffy ends up splitting Xander into two to where there's like a successful, more confident Xander. And then there's just normal, anxious, wacky Xander as well. And I love the fact that even with all that that goes on, Xander is still the voice of reason for Buffy when it comes down to a relationship with Riley because he truly does know her. And a lot of this evolves from him being in love with Buffy for how many years as it is at this point. And he's kind of had to push that over to the side. He knows Buffy well enough in her relationship with all these other guys, the what she needs to hear in the way that she's treating them, because he's been treated like that by Buffy as well, too. And so it's always kind of interesting to see the insight that Xander has had on Buffy and her life and her relationships. And it stinks that, you know, Buffy didn't really try to talk to her friends about all this a little bit sooner because Xander really does give her what she needs to hear. And it's just it's, it's not soon enough. It's not soon enough to help her out. Willow, on the other hand, who is really blossoming as this really powerful witch, um, is starting to show the cracks that are going to really emerge in season six and season seven. Because while she is showing that she's capable and she wants to protect her friends, and she wants to take a more offensive approach to what she's learning with her power. Um, there's also a lot of side eyes that are coming up about the way that she's using this newfound magic and power that she's learned about. And it really does play in the six and the seven because we know where that goes with Dark Willow. And I think they do a good job of, you know, at first it's not that big of a deal because she's doing so much of it with Tara and Tara's advising her and Tara's kind of the voice of reason. But then the times to where we clearly see that Tara has some trepidation about what uh, Willow is doing and the way that she's doing it shows that at some point, this has to be a problem. And it's a great build again for the final two seasons of the show. Willow really gets a chance to do a little bit more this season. 
Um, and with Giles, Giles as well too. You know, Giles hasn't been given the best, uh, the best to do. He was given some chances to shine here and there over season two and season three when it came to like uh, to Miss Calendar, or when it came to you know him starting to realize he is like Buffy's father basically. But between season four and this, he's kind of feeling a lot like a background player, which is literally the story they give him this uh, this season around is that. You know, he doesn't feel like he's needed. And then surprise, Buffy actually realizes she needs Giles for a lot of what her life is supposed to be. And I thought that was awesome because Giles actually got to do something, something different for once and be a little more important to the plot. And the last couple episodes of the season also really just like with Willow set into motion what we're going to see from Giles in the final two seasons because we always hear about Ripper and the the shit that Giles was involved in before him and Buffy became like you know the the relationship to Watcher and Slayer that they have but we really get to see a lot of that uh with these twinges of darkness that Giles has throughout the season including him ultimately having to murder Ben in order to protect the world from glory in the last episode and Spike Spike, interestingly enough, is, uh, you know, it goes back and forth with my enjoyment of Spike over season five, because after getting the chip implanted in his head in the previous season by the initiative, which stops him from being able to hurt any humans, there is some interesting plot threads with that, that, you know, he's still trying to keep the bravado. He's still trying to act like he's the guy in charge and everything, but it just doesn't seem to be do it like it's, it's not intimidating anybody at all. And he's realizing that he now is in love with Buffy. And that brings about some great character development for Spike because Spike's always been good in his appearances. Um, it, it, his appearances in like the first like three seasons or so. Season four, it's very hit or miss, honestly. Like before he gets the chip, it's really interesting. But in season five, you know, it, it's back and forth whether you're annoyed by him or not. But when he gets those really big character moments with Buffy or with Dawn or with Joyce, it's so interesting and it's so like it's the best acting that um, uh, that Marsters has gotten to do in the show itself. He's actually getting something to do because Spike is obviously very different from Angel in terms of the way that their love manifests for Buffy and the way that they interact with all the other people in Buffy's life and the antagonistic nature between Spike and the rest of the Scoobies just throws an interesting hurdle into that. And it makes Spike a much more fun character after he realizes he's in love with Buffy. That also brings us the first appearance of the Buffy bot, which will play in over uh, the course of, you know, the next season as well too. So it, it's just, there's a lot of great things we get out of Spike's love for Buffy finally showing up, even if I'm not a big fan of that relationship. <laughs> And then there's our villain, Glorithicus, Glory, who is absolutely without question my favorite villain of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. A lot of that being because Glory was actually the one who you knew could body Buffy at any time that she wanted to. You know, the master and jealous, uh, you know, the slayer, uh, the mayor, excuse me, I'm about to say the slayer, the mayor, you know, yeah, Angelus and the master could fight Buffy, but they're both about like the mind game, especially Angelus. Angelus was all about the mind games with Buffy, whereas the master wasn't really doing much himself. It was all the underlings taking care of everything. Uh, and even with Adam, even though Adam could absolutely fight Buffy as well too, and she needed the magical help to do it, I just feel that Glory being able to physically match up with Buffy and just choosing at times, like, look, I'd kill you right now, but I'm giving you a chance to give me what I want. That's on a different level from all these other bad guys that Buffy has interacted with. And the fact that Glory's complication is that at times she switches back into Ben adds to it as well, because we know that Ben is supposed to be this character that we hope uh, is going to help Buffy, is going to help the rest of the Scoobies out. But as the season keeps going on and on, even the good stuff that Ben is doing starts to seem just a little bit more dark. And, you know, something was scary about Glory, the fact that Glory didn't give a damn. She did not give a damn at all. Compared to all these other characters who are like, I can't do this and I can't do this. I'm going to keep this person alive. Like, Glory didn't care. Glory would routinely beat the shit out of various Scoobies and random characters through the show. And there, you know, even when Joyce died, 
which is again best episode of the show here it's so fantastic so heartfelt even when that happened there was like a little fear that glory could have been involved with that and i think that the writing of actually giving buffy a foil that you know she can actually talk to it's like her equal i think that helped both buffy and just the status of the villain out so so much especially considering where they go with our big bads of the final two seasons of the show so such a well done job incorporating uh glory glorificus the way that they did folks season five just is amazing that ending is one to you can't beat it in the least bit at all we get an angel cameo appearance throughout the season you get dracula xander's got his own episode we get a road trip there is so much good in this season and it features oscar winner amy adams as well too this season so there's so much for you to check out and i highly recommend doing it but that's going to do it for my recap of buffy season five if you want to hear more stay tuned because the very next episode which is starting right after this we'll have some more buffy talk going in it so now for question two for your chance to win a free digital copy of thanksgiving who has been a credited writer on every film in the child play series also known as the chucky series there has been one person who has been the writer on all of these films and the current TV show. Who is that? Let me know in the comment section to win another point. But folks, that is gonna do it for me tonight. My name is T and I'm reminding you, when there's no more room in hell, the dead will walk the earth. Rest in peace, Flyboy. Take it easy, y'all. Hey everybody, looking for a great way to stay up to date on horror news as well as read the best of articles on anything scary out in the world right now? Then you need to head over to the Fangoria shop and get yourself a subscription. If you go to shop.fangoria.com slash AXDW, you can use my own personalized 20% discount to save 20% off on Fangoria magazine subscriptions as well as 20% off any other items in their fantastic shop. This is a great deal. If you've ever been wanting to get yourself a subscription, now is the time to do so. Head to shop.fangoria.com slash AXDEW.